Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie zurück nach der Mittagspause, gestärkt für unsere hoffentlich spannende Debatte hier auf dem Podium und mit Ihnen. Wir wollen Sie früh einbeziehen. Überlegen Sie sich Fragen ähm, über die schwierige ähm, Frage, die sich seit den arabischen Revolutionen neu stellt, wie umgehen mit den neuen Eliten, wie umgehen mit dem politischen Islam. Ähm, ich will keine lange Vorrede hier machen. Ich brauche auch unsere Panelisten nicht umständlich vorzustellen. Einige von Ihnen waren schon auf anderen Panels. Ähm, lassen Sie mich nur so viel sagen. Ähm, wir haben hier eine wunderbare Gelegenheit, dieses Thema multidimensional zu besprechen, weil wir verschiedene Perspektiven hier auf dem Podium haben. Nämlich einmal die aus Ägypten von äh, Dr. Abdul Mogut Daderi, der als Abgeordneter der äh, FJP, Freedom and Justice Party, äh, ein Akteur ist dieses Wandels. Er ist im Parlament im Auswärtigen Ausschuss in Kairo und im Tourismuskomitee. Zwei entscheidende Sektoren, die die weitere Entwicklung Ägyptens bestimmen werden. Ähm, dann haben wir einen schon auf dem früheren Panel äh, hier präsent gewesenen auswärtigen Beobachter, der aber auch ein Mitakteur in diesem Wandel ist, nämlich Dr. Rasman Masmoudi, der ähm, in Washington einen Think Tank über Islam und Demokratie betreibt, von dem schon seit Jahren wichtige Impulse für diese Debatte ausgehen, der aber auch mittlerweile sein halbes äh, Leben in Tunis verbringt, wo er versucht, ganz praktisch mitzuhelfen, diese junge Demokratie mit aufzubauen, indem er dort mit Gruppen zusammenarbeitet, die äh, sich beteiligen wollen an, dieser neuen, ähm, an diesem neuen Tunesien, äh, die Debatte über die Verfassung führen, über die Frage, äh, wie dieser neue Staat aussehen soll und wie eine Demokratie bottom-up äh, gebaut werden kann. Zuletzt, aber ähm, last but not least, ähm, Frau Vinas Toprak aus der Türkei. Auch eine ganz wichtige Perspektive, glaube ich, weil äh, die Türkei schließlich schon eine längere Erfahrung mit ähm, Islamisten oder ehemaligen Islamisten an der Macht hat. Und Frau äh, Dr. Vinas Toprak ist als Abgeordnete der CHP, also der Oppositionspartei, die mit unserer Sozialdemokratie verschwestert ist, im Parlament in Ankara und vertritt Istanbul und wird uns von ihren Erfahrungen berichten, was es bedeutet, wenn der organisierte politische Islam eine Rolle spielt und Macht bekommt in einem Staat, der sich als säkular, aber islamisch geprägt Begreift. Ich würde gerne damit beginnen, dass wir hier oben auf dem Podium von unseren äh, drei Teilnehmern ähm, relativ kurze Statements bekommen zu diesem Thema. Dann werde ich ein bisschen äh, Fragen äh, dazu stellen und äh, Sie können sich gerne gleich dann mitbeteiligen und unsere Diskussion vorantreiben. Ähm, Frau Toprak, vielleicht beginnen Sie. Would you like to take the floor? Thank you very much. We don't have much time, apparently five minutes, uh, Mr. Lau said. Uh, I don't know what I can uh, tell you in five minutes, but I'll start where we left off uh, yesterday about uh, economic development uh, versus democracy. Uh, there was somewhat of a debate, and it was my impression that for many in Western publics, the idea was that if you have economic development, then democracy will follow. 
Um, that's a very long debate in political science literature, very old debate, actually. And there were proponents of both uh, uh, sides. Some people argued, looking at the East Asian tigers, for example, that authoritarianism is best suited for economic development, and others for democracy, that with democracy comes economic development. Uh, whatever the consensus was, and I think the consensus was generally that in the long run, if we're not all dead, as Keynes said, uh, democracy does better serve uh, 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 economic uh, ends, uh, but that the reverse is not true. In other words, that with economic development and industrialization, it's not necessarily the case that you will have democratic forms of government. Maybe in the very, very, very long periods of time, but uh, not within anyone's lifetime, and perhaps you know, not in the lifetime of next generations uh, either. Uh, now, therefore, for you know, uh, the, the choice at one time seemed to be between economic development versus democracy, for secular publics and uh, for especially women in MENA countries, I think the dilemma now seems to be the following: democracy, yes, but with democracy comes Islamist governments, who can be as repressive as the old masters. Uh, Egypt and Tunisia are cases in point. We don't know yet how those countries will uh, evolve, but it is the case that the uh, majorities do seem to elect uh, Islamist, uh, uh, Islamist political uh, parties. Now, from the point of view of democracy or commitment to democracy, you could ask, well, what's wrong with it? You know, if that's what people want, that's what you should... Get. And as Ms. Dardry said yesterday, for instance, he said, uh, well, you know, it's the people's will and that uh, uh, we're going to establish a regime that's suitable for Egypt. I find that to be very, very problematic, that there are forms of democracy that are suitable for Islamic countries, and then there are forms of democracy that, that are suitable for Western countries. And I think this is the dilemma that quite often EU countries face. Uh, one could argue that uh, this is some new form of Orientalism. You know, well, this isn't good for us, but it might be good for the rest of the Muslim world because, you know, because they're different. Uh, there is no problem if uh, that's what people want, obviously, but if Islamist governments are committed to political liberalism, unfortunately, what you often get are uh, regimes that are illiberal democracies. And uh, I think uh, that is very much the case uh, when you have Islamist political parties in power. I'll give very briefly the example of uh, Turkey under the Justice and Development Party that, that you have in uh, Egypt. Uh, which, uh, which has been in power for the last 10 years. Uh, using Islam to get votes, what the Justice and Development Party is now doing is getting more and more authoritarian so that one has to speak really about a one-party state in Turkey today rather than a democracy because the understanding of democracy, of the Justice and Development Party, and I have a feeling, although I'm not really versed in Middle East politics, uh, that is the same understanding with Islamist parties in the Arab world, is that democracy is a mathematical game. You get the votes, you you come to power, and then you claim that you represent the people, whereas, of course, you only represent part of the public. And therefore, you can do whatever you want without any regard to the opposition. Uh, so it's a matter of you know, counting votes, uh, which, of course, is not what democracy is about, because democracy is about bargaining, democracy is about uh, 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 making sure that... 
uh, opposition views are taken into account. Uh, democracy is about reaching some kind of a consensus and paying heed to political minorities, uh, as well as, of course, to religious and other minorities. By political minorities, I mean people who have lost out in elections. Uh, in giving examples of the AKP government in Tur Turkey, let me start with two stories, and maybe I won't even have to tell you the rest. One has to do with a trial I attended in Ankara involving 26 university students. They were in jail for six months. The trial is still going on. It hasn't been concluded. This was their first time after six months in front of a judge. So they were being detained without Take, being taken into, uh, into court, which now has become a regular practice in Turkey, this total disregard of judicial uh, procedures. There are people waiting for three years uh, in detention without even knowing what their, their, their crime is because they haven't been told. Uh, but anyway, I attended this trial. Now, what did these 26 students do? Half of them threw eggs to a government minister when he was speaking on their campus. And the other half protested against the prime minister when he visited their campus. And guess how much the prosecu prosecutor is asking for these kids? You know, you just guess. Five years, 10 years, 48 years. This is crazy in any democratic, any country that calls itself democratic, that a prosecutor is asking for 48 years to 21, 22-year-old kids uh, whose only crime is to protest the minister and the prime minister. And of course, they're being tried under anti-terrorism law, uh, which seems to be the case uh, uh, in many, uh, uh, in many uh, events. My the second story is about a friend of mine with whom, as an academic, before I joined the uh, parliament, uh, I carried a study uh, in Anatolian towns about the discrimination people with different identities faced. So I know him well. I mean, I traveled with him and two other young men in Anatolia for, for, a, for a whole year. Uh, he wrote a book on the assassination of the Armenian journalist Hrant Dink some years ago, arguing that the Turkish police was negligent and in fact tried to cover up the, the crime and had a hand in the crime. Uh, he was taken to court for writing this book. Uh, the prosecutor was asking for 37 years for him, whereas for the murderer, it was 28 years. So this is the kind of democracy we now have. Uh, the media has been totally silenced. Uh, Turkey is, uh, there is no country that's democratic that has so many journalists in jail, and in fact, no non-democratic country either. Turkey comes second after China uh, as far as the number of journalists in jail for various things that they have uh, written. Uh, not only that, the most important personalities in uh, journalism and, and the media, columnists, as well as uh, uh, commentators on, on various TV channels and so on, have lost their jobs because the government has put pressure on uh, t TV owners and newspaper owners, uh, mostly financial pressure, uh, as a result, a result of which these people have been fired. Uh, student protests, like I said, are brutally repressed by the, uh, by the police. The judiciary, and that's thanks to the EU, because the EU supported the last referendum. Uh, I wrote uh, with, a, with a number uh, of friends in a citizen's platform letters to Stefan Fule and members of the European Parliament not to support that uh, 
uh, last referendum uh, in September, but they thought that this was going to be uh, uh, this was going to democratize the judiciary. The result has been that the judiciary is now under the control of the uh, government, including the top echelons of the judiciary, the constitutional court and other high courts. And like I said, legal procedures are totally violated, long detentions without trial, secret witnesses, you, you don't even know, you know, their names aren't given, and you don't even know whether these people exist or whether it's a fabrication against you, uh, as well as... Um, individualized laws, you know, laws that, are, that the government passes to save one single person, for example, from being persecuted. And the bureaucracy has been completely, and I'll be finishing, the bureaucracy has been completely filled with AKP supporters through non-merit appointments, not only top bureaucratic cadres, which all governments uh, do, but down to cleaners and government officers, offices, so teachers, uh, and principals of schools, vice principals, and the government uh, educational offices and health offices and, and so on. Uh, so that, uh, I mean, I could give various examples. The Alevi community, for example, which is a religious minority co community, uh, are being uh, discriminated against, and we could maybe talk about it. Alcohol bans in various Anatolian but cities. But they have been discriminated so against before. I mean, yes. it's not, not all... No, it's true. It's true that they have been discriminated against, but not to this extent. <clears throat> uh, because right now, uh, all government offices have been almost cleaned of, uh, of the Alevi. There are very few Alevi now who hold jobs. Plus, of course, there was no demand in the past about their uh, places of worship. Uh, they don't go to the mosques. And uh, the present government is saying, well, aren't you Muslims? You know, go pray in the mosques. For, for centuries they haven't, because there's, there's stories attached to it. Uh, it's like saying to, I don't know, Catholics here in Germany, aren't you Christians? You know, why do you want Catholic church? Go, go to the Protestant church, churches, which would be uh, funny. So... And finally, a totally dysfunctional parliament. I mean, uh, with 50% of the vote, the AKP can pass any law it wants, and opposition parties, uh, plus, of course, is represented in the parliament because of the 10% barrier. Please, please let's, let's stop here. We, yeah. we, we, can, we can discuss so all these. So let me issues. say one last sentence, and that's the, uh, uh, that's the following. Oh, two sentences that uh, <laughs> or, have a short two sentences. So what's problematic about the AKP government is that it uses votes, no, it uses Islam to get votes, but once in power, gradually controls all social and political power centers. So like I said, it's getting to be more and more authoritarian. And finally, the second sentence, the vision is an economically advanced country. Turkey has done very well economically. And that goes back to my original comment. An economically advanced country, happy consumers in big shopping malls and so on. And, you know, in every city in Turkey, there are the in shopping malls, but where uh, rule of law, rights and liberties are lacking and people don't care because they're happy about their economic position. Uh, this is the model of the Gulf states, you could, you could argue, uh, 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 and but I'll end there, maybe talk about um, EU's role as no, a disappointing, later, later, later. disappointing Let, role later on. Let's bring in the rest of the on. panel and, and we can okay. discuss... Uh, the other issues. Uh, Mr. Daderi, I would like to jump in with a question to confuse the fronts a little bit here because uh, I think uh, we, this is good for the discussion because we, I think we are going to have a pretty heated discussion here. Yeah. <laughs> but let me confuse the panel a little bit with uh, uh, something that happened almost a year ago. No, yeah, a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, Prime Minister Erdogan went to Cairo. And he was 
greeted like a rock star, like mm -hmm. the Mick Jagger of political Islam or something like that. Then he said something that caused quite a stir. He said, um, and I'm going to quote uh, from Al Arabiya, uh, a secular state uh, represents all religions. Do not be wary of secularism. I hope there will be a secular state in Egypt, he concluded. And the Muslim Brotherhood wasn't too happy about these comments. Uh, it was also confusing for me because I thought, who's talking here? Is this Atatürk or Erdogan? Uh, why is he defending secularism in, in, in Cairo while at the same time at home, as you pointed out, uh, it's eroding? We can, we can get into this. No, 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 no. no please, Mr. Dad, Mr. Okay. Mr. I mean, uh, okay. uh, secularism as a model in Egypt, uh, all the, um, the issues that Mrs. Toprak raised, what, is, this going, is this the future of Egypt that we just heard about? Okay, so let me first start by thanking uh, the organizer for involving us uh, into this uh, engagement. And I would like to thank you all for your willingness to uh, uh, listen and get engaged with issues concerning uh, Egypt and the Arab world. Uh, in Egypt, we were thinking uh, of looking seriously into Erdogan's model but after listening here, we would like, we will not listen, we will not consider it that much anymore politically. Maybe economically we will. Uh, the, it's very important. Terms have ge geographical limitations. And it is very important in the coming years, we listen from one another rather than listening about one another. And that's why it is very important we speak to one another firsthand information. Uh, there is a premise that I would like to start the few minutes I have with. The premise is, the more we do not understand one another, the more prejudiced we become. And the more prejudice we develop, it's likely to lead to hatred. And if hat hatred gets established then violence can follow. And from the very beginning, we would like to base our own relationship on understanding, mutual understanding and mutual respect. And the challenge for us is how can we work together while being different? This diversity is very important once we talk about different cultures, different countries, different religions, different languages. It's crucial for us. We cannot... And we should not impose one model on any other country. We've had this experience in the past in Egypt. The British came to us, stayed 70 years. They tried to impose their model. Look at what the Egyptians did in Tahrir Square. When the Egyptians marched in Tahrir Square, they were declaring the end of post-colonialism. The Egyptians, as people, have their own history have their own tradition, and they would like to develop an alternative that fits the Egyptian people. And this is how I see the essence of democracy, is people have the right to rule themselves according to what they want, not according to what others want. So back to your question concerning secularism, the unfortunate thing about uh, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, when he came in Egypt, the 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 refusal of his statement was not because of what he said, but because of the timing it was said. It was said in a highly uh, heated political discussion in Egypt, which direction uh, is Egypt taking? And in this regard, based on the premise I made, let me share with you a couple of things. Do, does Freedom and Justice Party call for a religious state by calling for an Islamic democracy? Does it mean really a theocracy? And I would like to state clearly, not at all. We cannot have a theocracy in Egypt. In fact, Islam does not call for, for a theocracy. Muslims have been in the world for the past 1,400 years, and we never, we rarely had theocracy. It did happen a few times in history, but it was wrong and everyone suffered from. So our project in the coming years is against theocracy. So what are you for? 
Are you for secularism? No, we're not. We're thinking of another alternative. We're trying to come up with something like a spiritual secularism or secular spirituality. And it is really challenging. How can you keep the two? How can you keep the tradition? And at the same time, people have the right to elect the representative uh, and to watch uh, them. I, I was given a few uh, premises that I would like to go very quickly uh, uh, over them. Uh, the first premise is about political Islam. I don't know even if we agree about this concept of political Islam, social Islam, economic Islam. We think of Islam as a way of life. Uh, and it is very difficult to take just the political component of it. When we come to examples later, we will understand that Islam presents itself as a way of life where everyone can live together keeping their own tradition, even their own religion. And we've had this experience in the Muslim world for the past 14. I'll just give you one example to keep in mind, and we can discuss it later. Look at the Muslim, the Coptic experience in Egypt and the Muslim experience in Spain. And you can understand the, clearly the difference between an Islamic way of life or a Catholic or a Christian way uh, of life. Look what happened to Muslims in Spain. They were offered three choices either to change their religion, excommunicate it, or leave the country. But, but look at Muslims, look, look at Copts in, 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 in Egypt. For the past 14, until today, you will find the churches that were built before Islam came. When Jesus, peace be upon him, came to Egypt, you will find the churches that are still, until today, not touched by the Muslim rule for the past 14 uh, so this is a matter of really uh, understanding that uh, I would like to pay attention to. Now, concerning Turkey is a model or, or not, I, I don't think uh, we were confronted by this question many times. Will you take Turkey or Malaysia as models? And I always say we will take Egypt as model. We will benefit from the Turkish experience. We'll benefit from the economic Malaysian experience. We will benefit from European experience. We'll benefit from anywhere we can so that we create an Egyptian experience. And for those of you who uh, had the chance to visit Egypt, uh, there is a meal called kushari. And this kushari meal uh, is made of different ingredients, but it is only available in Egypt. It has the lentils, the onions, the garlic, the rice, the macaroni, but Egyptians mix them together and produce a different alternative. Can Egyptians do this move from the kushari uh, uh, for a stomach to the kushari for uh, politics and economics? Uh, there is this hope and determination that Egyptians will move in this direction. There is also a premise, are there limits for dialogue with Europe? I will say no limits. As long as one condition that it does not go against the interest of the Egyptian people. That is the only limitation that we can discuss in detail. Concerning the Islamization of Egyptian society. Let me make it clear that the majority of Egyptians, and that is different from Turkey. No less than 90% of Egyptians will go to the mosque on a regular basis and will pray on Friday. Together, So that's a very uh, distinctive uh, uh, point between Egyptian society. So Egyptians are looking for Islamization of that society is already Muslim. It was just suppressed for the past decades. And when it was given a chance, I was asking a friend of mine yesterday, what did you like about the Egyptian revolution? He said, I loved the Tahriri Square gatherings. Did you like it all? He said, no, there was one problem with that. I said, what is that? I was told that they were praying in Tahriri Square. This prayer was misunderstood. It does not mean that it is a religious or a theological alternative. And that is something we really have to understand is this Islam presents itself as a way of life. Very difficult to separate the prayer in Tahrir Square when people were marching against the police brutality and the time for prayer came. You saw the people standing on the bridge and doing the prayer, very peaceful prayer, and the police were attacking them 
by all possible means. And this is the unique characteristic that Islam is presenting as an alternative for Muslims, not necessarily uh, for others. Two more points, uh, 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 and, and then I will leave. Now, where do we go from here? I think, as I stated last night, that Egyptians, and I think in the Arab world in general, colonialism created this inferiority complex. So everything that is European was welcome, and anything that was Egyptian was looked, up, was looked down upon. This has to change. And I think the beginning of the change was the Egyptian revolution. The Egyptians revolted without the help of Europe. The Egyptians did not need the Americans to come and bombard the system of Mubarak so that they can have their democracy like in Iraq. The Egyptians revolted their way and were able to change the situation. The, during all the days of the revolution, not one single European or American interest was attacked. There were lots of stores, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's, on the borders of Tahrir Square, and none of them. I come from a city called Luxor, and it is full of tourists, not one single tourist in the city, because we did not look at Europeans as the enemy. We looked at the Mubarak regime as the enemy, but we cared a lot about the support of Mubarak regime. And in spite of the European administration and the U.S. administration, knew of the police brutality. How can we go to the future? The future, we have a lot to do together. Based on this mutual understanding, we demand mutual respect. We have to be respected. In the, we're not going to be the colonized anymore. But at the same time, we do not want to become the colonizer. We would like to create a model where all of us are equal and we can benefit a lot from Europe, especially from the German experience of unifying the East part and the West part. We can learn a lot of how dealing with the police uh, apparatus in Eastern, in Eastern Germany. We would like to learn also from uh, reforming the judiciary. Uh, reforming the police security, also the renewable energy. We would really love in Egypt, it is, uh, the sun is available 24-7. We can really benefit a lot from that energy so that it can benefit Egypt and benefit uh, the others uh, as well. We have a lot to do together. Let us work together. We have things to agree upon and things we disagree. Let us work on what we agree, which is almost 70%, 80%. And let us leave the other 20% aside. Hopefully by time we'll be able to develop better understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daderi. Between uh, the Turkish model, the emerging Egyptian model, uh, now the view from Tunis and Washington. Uh, please, Mr. Masmouri. Thank you very much, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, of course, I come to you uh, from Tunisia, which uh, is interesting because we have a different set of challenges. Tunisia is kind of a mix between Turkey and Egypt. Uh, half of Tunisia is secular, like Turkey, and the other half is religious, like Egypt. So we have a real big challenge of how to make these two halves live together uh, in peace in a, in a small country uh, 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 called Tunisia. Anyway, so we have a, a lot of challenges. I'm the president of the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy, which for the last 13 or 14 years uh, have been based in Washington, D.C., have been working on this main issue of democracy in the Arab world and how to deal with Islamic parties and Islamic movements. Uh, our goal from the beginning was to change U.S. policy toward the region 14 years ago. Policy was, at that time, this was in 1998, 1999, when we were founded, was supporting dictators. It was very obvious, you know, stability comes first. These are our friends, and we didn't really care how they treated their own people. And at that time, we started by saying, this is wrong. This is really uh, wrong policy because it doesn't even serve the interest of the United States in the long term. By supporting dictators, you're going to make everybody hate you. You're going to make the whole people hate you and blame you for all the problems and for everything that the dictator does because you are supporting Mubarak or Ben Ali in those countries. And then, of course, it took 9-11 to really shock the system. 
and for America to really realize the danger of violence and extremism. And I think the United States quickly uh, studied the phenomena of extremism and quickly realized within a year or two that one of the main reasons for the rise of uh, fundamentalism or extremism or radicalism is these governments, these regimes that have basically killed any chances of peaceful change, any chances of peaceful expression of opinion. People be were becoming hopeless. And when people become hopeless, they turn to violence, they turn to extremism. So in 2002, 2003, 2004, the United States really realized that we needed to change our policy and we cannot continue to support authoritarian regimes in the Arab world or in the Muslim world in general. But at that time, still in 2003, 2004, the policy was, okay, let's support democracy, but let's exclude the Islamic parties because we are afraid of them because we don't know whether they are, they, if they come to power, whether they will respect democracy or not, and wh what will their position be on women's rights, on human rights, on minority rights. So the policy between 2003 until about 2008 was we support democracy, but we, don't want, we do not support the Islamists or Islamic parties participating in the, uh, in the democratic process. And of course, we told them this was wrong. You cannot really build democracy and exclude the Islamists. It's, it's not possible. Not in Egypt, not in Tunisia, not in any Muslim country. Because they represent at least 30 to 40 percent of the population. How can you build democracy and exclude 30 or 40 percent of the population? It doesn't make any sense. <coughs> so... After 2008, the uh, United States, I think, started to think about or to realize that this was not possible, that if we really wanted to promote democracy and support democracy, we have to accept that the Islamists, the Islamic movements, the Islamic parties are part of the society, that they, we have to deal with them like we deal with all the other parties in the same way. If they win elections, we have to recognize them as legitimate uh, rulers or parties. So this, this was a gradual process. And then, of course, the revolutions happened um, just a year or two ago. And I th we were lucky, I think, that the United States and Europe uh, took the right position, which is, okay, we recognize these, these governments as legitimate. Uh, we will deal with these Islamic movements. We, will ac we accept their legitimacy. And then we will judge them based on what they do. We will see what they are going to do uh, in power, whether they will build democracy or not, whether they will respect human rights or not. So this is what is actually uh, happening now after, after the revolution. The question is, of course, now that these Islamic parties have won, even in Tunisia, they didn't win a majority, but they won 40%, and by far the strongest political party in Tunisia. There are many secular parties, they are all weak. The strongest one of them got 7 or 8% of the vote. So the Islamic movement got 40%. Uh, there is no way that uh, you could form a government in Tunisia and exclude uh, the Nahda party. And of course, in Egypt, they got even more, they got 60% or something, so they have a clear majority. Um, as my friend said, now the real challenge begins. What do we mean by democracy? And how do we build democracy in a country like Tunisia, in a country like Egypt? And what is the plan? What, we, well, what will these Islamic movements do? Will they respect these values? Will they build a real democracy? Or will they fail? I think this is the real test. And I think some of them will, will succeed and some of them will fail. Some of them will... Uh, will, will succeed, but over, after failing, you know, for, uh, for a few attempts, because there is no direct path. There is, it's not an easy path to build democracy after 50 years or more of tyranny, of dictatorship, of oppression. We have no institutions of democracy. We have no culture of democracy, because for 50 years, people were afraid to talk to each other or to to attend any meeting or to talk about politics or even to talk about religion, frankly. People were really uh, genuinely afraid, especially in Tunisia. T religion was banned and politics were banned. <coughs> so the, the question is, how do we build this democracy? And uh, we, have to be, we have to realize two things, I think. The first one is that there is no single model of democracy or of democratic government. There are some principles on which we all agree, but then even among the various countries in Europe or the various democratic countries around the world, there are different 
interpretations and different laws and different structures. So it's not possible to say, okay, this is the model, you have to follow this model, or you are not democratic. You have to become like Germany, or you have to become like the United States. It will not be possible. Secondly, we have to remember that it took the West, the United States or Europe, at least 100 years, maybe 200 years or more, to build this democracy. It's not fair to expect us in Tunisia or in Egypt to build it in one year or in two years and say, okay, now did you build democracy? Oh, you're not done yet, therefore you have failed. We have to realize it takes time. This is not an easy process. Um, there, was, there will be, of course, the question of, you know, what is the role of Islam in politics? This is, this is an issue that is debated even in the United States today, not the role of Islam, but the role of Christianity. You know, th there is no, sing no single model for, for secularism. In the United States, as you know, religion is very important. And half of the Republican Party are evangelicals. And you bet that they talk about religious values all the time in their meetings. And they talk about politics in the churches all the time. And it was very clear in America, you know, what the churches, uh, who the church was supporting in the last election. They made, didn't make any secret of it. So this, there is, uh, you know, there is no complete separation between religion and politics. There is separation, and I think I am in favor of, of, of separating the institutions, the political and religious institutions, but the values, the religious values are the same. And they are going to be dominant in the society. And therefore, a democratic government, of course, has to reflect those values. Because the values are the values of the people, and they are important in the society. You can't have a democratic government that does not reflect the values of the people. This is, it will not be democratic. But, of course, we don't want that democratic government to become a theocracy. And, in, you know, I agree with my friend that in, in Sunni Islam, at least, that risk is very little because we do not have an organized clergy in Sunni Islam. There is really no church. There is... No, this is the practice. This is the practice. We have religious leaders, but they are not organized. Finally, just one, one, uh, one thought. In order for democracy really to succeed in the Arab world and in the Muslim world, I think it's going to take time, but also it's going to require ishtihad. And some of you may be familiar with this, ter with, uh, this term, which, which means renewal of Islamic thinking or Islamic interpretation, ishtihad. And all the Muslim scholars agree that we need ishtihad, but we haven't been able to do ishtihad in the last 50 years or longer, maybe 100, you know, three, 400 years because of dictatorship. So I think the, the best thing about democracy that we have now in Tunisia or in Egypt right now, or in Libya and hopefully in other countries uh, soon, is that it will open the door of ishtihad. Because you cannot really do ishtihad without freedom. And now that we have freedom and democracy, we will re we open the door of ishtihad, which means we will come up with new interpretations of Islam and of the religion and of the text. New interpretations that are valid for the 21st century. And I think this can be done, but it will take time. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Let me uh, jump right in here where you uh, left off. Uh, and please indicate if, you're, if there are any questions already. But I would like to uh, come forward with, with one that just came up in my mind. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood used to say in opposition... Islam is the solution. That's the big banner uh, for whatever you were up to in opposition. Now, this is your, your, your governing. Uh, what does it actually mean? Is it an empty phrase now? What does it mean in fiscal policy to say Islam is the solution or education policy or whatever concrete area of policy? This is one, this is one question to you. What, what happens after you, you actually take charge of day-to-day -day issues? Uh, the whole debate about Sharia uh, between the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamic movements to your left, so to speak, the Salafi movements about Sharia implement... Those are to the right. 
to the right, to the left, <laughs> wherever you... <laughs> from both sides, maybe. Yeah. But uh, Sharia, implementing it now, implementing it fully, what actually <laughs> does it mean, Sharia? Uh, there is a whole debate going on there, which is very worrying for minorities who think it's against them and it's going to exclude them. But it's and women, uh, but it's but it's also part of maybe what you just indicated, uh, what you called ijtihad. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe maybe you could tell us a little bit yeah. about this. Uh, there is a there is a um, um, demonstration going on in in Cairo, I think just now, of Salafis and the Muslim <laughs> Brotherhood doesn't want to join today, they are calling for Sharia now. Mm -hmm. what, what do they mean? What mm -hmm. do you mean by Sharia? Yeah. Uh, thank you for asking uh, this, uh, these many questions. Uh, because now these questions are very much integral to the uh, discourse going on in Egypt now. These are uh, valid questions uh, and discussed on a daily basis in Egypt from all corners. Uh, I, uh, I, I believe Islam is the solution was not uh, made to be an empty, but the problem is the definition. What does it mean? And goes along with it, what is Sharia? For us, as the Freedom and Justice Party, Sharia means the rule of law. That everyone is equal. Every citizen, Muslim, Christian, men, women, old, young, are all equal. This is how we understand the Sharia law. Uh, Sharia law means economic development, empowering the poor. Uh, Sharia law means social justice. Uh, Sharia law means opening up to the world, benefiting from the good experiences, and leaving the negative ones. Uh, Sharia law uh, is, at the end of the day, working. We live in one world, and we have one humanity. And this humanity has different attitudes, different ways of thinking. The Americans developed something called the melting pot. Put all culture together and provide a dish that is made of all culture. We, I think, prefer another image called the salad bar, or where you have you. all, or the kushari. <laughs> we have all different cultures. We would like all people to live according to their own cultures. And we would like to live the same. We have our own tradition. And if we can, this is what I understand by Sharia and by Islam is a solution. I do not understand. I understand also that Sharia law is an inclusive alternative. At the time we say Muslims want Sharia law, we don't say this has to be imposed on the Coptics. The Copts, the Copts, we do not in Egypt look at them as a minority. They're part and parcel of the Egyptian society. And we, the Coptic Church itself, saying, we want Muslims to live according to, the, by the way, the, way, the word Sharia ah means law. Uh, so the Coptic Church issued, especially late Pope Shunoda, said we would like Muslims to live according to their Sharia ah because that will give us a chance to live according to our Sharia. Ah. Even the Coptic Church would like to have their own Sharia, ah, uh, the same as Muslims. And that is, the, this, this is the, the new ornament of the world. You remember the Spanish, the good, positive Spanish experience where Muslims, Jews, and Christians lived together and were ruling over Spain, produced the greatest renaissance to Europe during that time. Unfortunately, the experience didn't move forward. For minorities, as I stated clearly, that we don't look at Christians as minority. Of course, secular, secular Egyptians are very different from secular Turks or secular Tunisians. Very different, by the way. I and you, and, and you can I ask. Know, I know a lot of secular Egyptians. Yeah, I, 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 yeah I live with them. <laughs> so, for example, they're different in what, in what sense? For example, secular in Egypt will go to the mosque and will pray. All the challenge is how can you bring religion to Islam? That is their, but they live Islam. You cannot. I mean, many seculars in Egypt on TV will say, we are Muslims, but we look at things different. So if we can respect each other's different understanding, I think in Egypt we're likely to move forward in the right direction and let us give it the time it needs. Let us see if they succeed, it becomes good. If they, does, if they do not succeed, then it becomes a learning experience. 
Mrs. Topak, you want to, yeah. to reply? Uh, uh, qu first question is, yeah. is here, the uh, young man in the white shirt. First of all, shirt. about seculars in Egypt and Turkey. I think you have a wrong picture of Turkey, and that's uh, generally the case in the Arab world, that secular Turks are godless and they are non-believers. That's not true. I mean, there are studies after studies these are based on public opinion surveys where 97% of the people consider themselves to be Muslim. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will equate Islam, uh, the secular people, with mosque going. But I know a lot of people who will fast during Ramadan, but at the same time, if women, they don't cover, they'll wear miniskirts and, and bikinis and drink and so on. So I think, uh, you know, uh, to, to argue that there, there, there's this, this wide difference simply because, you know, seculars in, in Egypt go to mosque is unfair. That's one thing. And that's precisely, I think, the point. The idea is that if you don't live what seems to be an Islamic way of life as defined by Islamic parties, then you're godless and you're the other. Uh, that seems to be a major problem with many Islamist parties because I don't understand when you say Egyptians want to live uh, or they take Islam to be a way of life. I don't know what that means. I can I'll give you it. two examples. I'll give you two examples. Uh, some years ago, a man wrote a, an interpretation of the Quran, which Al Azhar did not, you know, the, the ulema in Al Azhar did not like. A Muslim. He was a Muslim man married to a Muslim woman. This became an international case. Uh, then, El Azhar, even though there is no excommunication in Islam, El Azhar excommunicates him from the Muslim community because he wrote this interpretation that they don't like, that according to their understanding of what Islam and Sharia is, it doesn't fit. And then they open a divorce case against the couple because a Muslim woman can no longer be, stay married to a non-Muslim man because he's now a non-Muslim since al decided that he's a non-Muslim. I mean, this is... You know, this, this happened even before Egypt had uh, Sharia law. Plus, I do know that on many issues in Egypt, for instance, inheritance laws, and that's the major difference between seculars in Turkey and seculars in Egypt. I know friends, academics, you know, uh, who are totally, quote-unquote, westernized and secular, who will nevertheless argue that it's fair for a man to inherit more than, uh, uh, than his uh, uh, sisters because this is the way things are, which would be totally incomprehensible to any secular person and even an Islamist person in Turkey. So uh, I think you would have to sort of explain what you mean by, an, uh, by uh, an Islamic way of life and this Egyptian model. The same goes for you, you know, a, a, a model that's different uh, uh, and that's specific to, to uh, Tunisia or to the Muslim world. I really don't understand what uh, exactly that is. It's not really true that there are differences among democracies. When you come down to principles, there might be differences as to whether it's a parliamentary government or a presidential government. There might be differences in terms of their voting uh, uh, patterns or voting uh, electoral laws and so on. But when it comes down to principles, yes, America is, is religious. But their law is not religious. It's not based on religion. Neither is their education system. Neither is there uh, sometimes uh, as on issues like abortion, for example, or gay rights. Uh, uh, there are differences between Democrats and, and Republicans, and the same goes for Europe between Christian Democrats and Social Democrats. Yes, these differences exist, but at the end of the day, the lo law is secular law, not religious law. Let's, so uh, let's, let's bring in uh, uh, the public. You know, I don't know we, we what can... this uh, different model of democracy <laughs> is. You would yeah. really have to. Sure, sure. You would really you, have you, to explain. Have a, yeah, yeah, I win. <laughs> Thank you. Because. I guess the question is for you. <laughs> so. uh, my, my question is indeed especially for uh, uh, Dr. Masmoudi. 
Uh, my name is Edmund Radka. I am from the Public Science Department uh, from Munich University, and I'm trying to uh, we, are, we are trying to uh, put in place or have put in place an exchange between uh, German and Tunisian students and academics. Something we didn't do before, by the way. And one of the major concerns in Tunisia and with our Tunisian partners is the Salafist movement. And I would uh, like to have a take on that. You surely know the Manuba incident where Salafists occupied the university. So this is really something which affects people and our cooperation also with, uh, with our Tunisian uh, friends. So have you any idea where the Salafists in Tunisia have their financial ideological and personal resources resources from. Uh, is this our brother Tunisian phenomenon or in how far are connections to other actors in the region evident? And what may be the relationship between Inahda and Salafists? I think this is one of the major questions in Tunisia. And the last point, what is the solution? How to deal with this phenomenon? Is it rather like, sh should Tun the Tunisian government be more tough on Salafists? For now, they can do their street militia thing and are a little are, are not stopped. Or maybe a like politicization of of the Salafist movement be a solution. The first Salafist party has registered now in Tunisia, so have we to bring them into the political process? Thank you. Um, can I just add? Could you please, if you if you answer this question, add something about how you think the European governments should actually. They're obviously talking to the Muslim Brotherhood. This is official. Uh, <laughs> should they also talk to everybody, to yeah. the Salafists of, of every kind of uh, color? Um, uh, okay. Uh, I'll try to be very brief because I know there are lots of questions and I think it's important to really have as many questions as possible. So I'll try to be very, very brief. First of all, about the Sharia, the question of Sharia. Uh, Nahda movement, which is the main Islamic party in Tunisia, has already announced in last March that they will not put Sharia ah in the constitution and it will not be one of the sources of legislation in the, in the, in the country. And this is, again, an Islamic movement, but said we don't want Sharia. Ah. The main reason is because, again, there are different interpretations of Sharia. Ah. And there is no clear definition of what Sharia ah means. So they said to avoid any conflict or contradiction, we're not going to use the word sharia at all uh, in, in the Constitution. Now, one problem that I have with, the, with the, uh, that I think the Muslims have in general is that in the past, Islam has been very, very tolerant with other religious minorities. This is true. The sharia was applied to Muslims, but Christians had their own laws, mm -hmm. Jews had their own laws, other religious minorities had their own laws and their own legal systems and judges and everything. And this worked very well for the last, you know, thousand years or whatever. I don't think it can work very well now in the 21st century. And this is the problem. Mm -hmm. We now need laws that treat all citizens are equal, no matter what their religion is. And so this poses questions for Islamic thinking. And, and also and, for men and women. And men and women, and well, you many know, issues. That's a many very issues. important issue. We, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it is appropriate for in Egypt or anywhere to say, okay, we have laws in a modern democratic state, to say we have laws for Muslims, and we have separate laws for Christians, and we have separate laws for Jews, or we have separate laws for other people who are no, have no religion. You know, this is not feasible. <laughs> we, we have to... And again, this is related to the question of ishtihad. This is where, you know, this concept of citizenship is new. It's a, it's a modern concept. And, and therefore, we in, in the Muslim world and Muslim scholars have to th rethink how, how do we deal with this issue. We don't want people to be converting from one religion to the other just because they don't like this law, they want to apply another law, or, or vice versa. Now, the question of the Salafist uh, movement, I think it is a, um, a, the, one of the biggest problems we have in Tunisia today is how to deal with the, with the rise of Salafi movements uh, after the revolution. Before the revolution, they basically did not exist at all. And all of a sudden, after the revolution and after all the freedoms that we have, they started becoming extremely active, extremely visible. They even took control of 30% of the mosques um, and so on. I think it's important to realize that in terms of their numbers, they are very small. 
estimates range between 30,000 and 50,000 in the whole country of 10 million people. So they are really uh, a minuscule group. And it's also very clear that they have financial support from the Gulf countries, from uh, rich individuals, not necessarily the, the states, not necessarily the governments, but in the rich individuals and rich organizations in Saudi Arabia, in, in Kuwait, in Qatar, in uh, Emirates, and so on. It's also very clear that they are very heavily infiltrated and manipulated by people who want to destroy the democratic transition. This is very clear. By pro-Ben Ali people, for example, they are heavily in, this, in these movements. By other forces that want to destroy Tunisia's chance of success uh, uh, for democracy. So it is a real problem. How do you deal with them? They are a small group, but if, you know, what do you do with them? And the government and the Nahda in particular for the last two years has chosen the policy of being very lenient with them and trying to uh, encourage them to, to become part of the political process. They have legalized three parties, not just one, three Salafi parties now exist in Tunisia. Uh, and they were very lenient to them. They didn't want to confront them. They were afraid that if we confronted them, they would become more violent and the situation could get out of control, could get out of hand. So they were trying to encourage them to, to become peaceful and to be more peaceful. Out of the 30 or 50,000 Salafis, maybe 5,000 are jihadis, which means are violent Salafis. They're, these are people who were in Iraq, who were in Afghanistan, who were in Pakistan, who were in, outside of Tunisia in, in radical groups. And now after the revolution, they came back to Tunisia. So what do you do with them? If you start fighting them, they will retaliate. So it's a, it's a very, very issue, you know, a tough issue in Tunisia. The government, again, has been very lenient, but I think after the last attack on the embassy, on the U.S. embassy in Tunis on September 14th, the government and the Nahda have started to realize that uh, they are a real threat and that if you are too lenient with them, it doesn't mean they're going to be peaceful. It, 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 may, it may mean that they will become stronger and stronger and they will become a, a more dangerous and, and a more serious of a threat. So I think it's a very, very difficult issue. How do you deal with them? But I think now there is common agreement in Tunisia that we need to be tough with those who advocate violence or who practice violence, that there shouldn't be any mercy, there shouldn't be any leniency with people who advocate violence. We have to draw the line on, on violence. Thank you. Um, there is another question here. And over there. Uh, waren Sie vorher? Ja? Uh, erst der Herr da, da hinten in der Mitte und dann hier vorne. Vielleicht können wir ein paar uh, Fragen okay. sammeln. I'm Gerd Klöver from the... Ähm, habe ich zur Kenntnis genommen. Aber wir sind jetzt hier in der Reihe, bitte. Entschuldigung. Okay, ich bin schon. I'm Gerd Klöver, Ebert Stiftung in Egypt. My question goes to Abdelmagid. I have my sympathy for your statement. Ich die hat. And secondly, uh, how to build bridges. Uh, you know, and you said that Spain shows that for you. 100 years and more, thousand almost, Christian and Islamic uh, rulers have lived in peace until Reconquista came and changed this. In Egypt, the same. Before Muslim came, before Muhammad, God bless him, Egypt was Christian. And for a thousand years and more, they lived together peacefully. Only later on, Islamic rulers have used politically Islam in their way misused is for their purposes. So Islam per se, as you said, is peaceful. I agree with you. And there's no reason why this shouldn't be in the future. Now my question. Uh, the task for the future is to build bridges between peaceful Islamic tendencies and peaceful Christian tendencies. How to do this? Can Turkey be a model? Can Islamic can traditional Islamic way or to Sharia can be modernized or even discussed, which is now not possible? Is there a way to a modern kind of Islam? And what do you mean by ishtihad? 
Is this the same? Is, does this mean opening of the traditional Islam to answer to modern questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's collect some questions and then you can, can answer it. Uh, hi, my name is Jan. Um, um, I think going back to the question whether um, uh, calling for different models or versions of democracy is a kind of new orientalization, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, uh, you know, when you, I think what Said really meant is uh, that what Europeans had in mind was that there's one image of, of mankind and that we had discovered it and that you know, the, the, the way that scholarship on the region was organized was simply to serve as an obfuscation of, 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 of that. And it was like some people weren't quite there yet. You know? And I think that this idea, this, exactly this universalism, this uh, 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 belief in the West that we have discovered what mankind is all about, this is what basically caused the world we live in, and I don't quite like it uh, terribly much, to be honest. And thank you very much for your comments on, on um, a new thought in, in Islam, because I really do hope that uh, something new will come out of the region. And to me, the primary region I would look to, maybe outside of China, um, for new ideas of how to organize society. And I think, I think we're desperately in need of it. And so my question is, um, for that to happen, you need innovation uh, and, and new thinking. And um, while the FJP is relatively open, the question was to you, Dr. Dari, of, of course, um, the Ikhwan is still relatively close, and that's where most of the thinking happens. Um, I hear a lot of young people complaining about that. Um, so what do you do to open up? What do you do to get the fresh thinking um, started? Thank you. Mein Name ist Zab, ich komme ursprünglich aus dem Iran und Sie wissen schon, dass Iraner schon seit über 30 Jahren ähm, Erfahrungen mit Islam gemacht haben. Daher meine Frage, was Sie unter politischen Islam verstehen. Das ist, ist äh, der Islam, was also Saudi-Arabien meint, also meinen Sie Islam, was Iran darunter versteht oder Taliban in Afghanistan oder ja, Schieten, Salafisten äh, oder Sunniten. Ähm, Sie wissen schon, in, ähm, in Ägypten, die Leute sind auf die Straße gegangen, als das Brot teuer wurde. Nicht, weil sie äh, Mubarak als ein schlechter oder ähm, guter Muslim in Frage gestellt haben. Und äh, ich denke, meine Meinung will ich auch dann jetzt äh, auch dazu äußern. Ich denke, im 21. Jahrhundert, wir müssen, wie äh, das deutsche Sprichwort sagt, Kirche im Dorf lassen, weder von äh, äh, Christentum reden noch von Islam, sondern äh, Tacheles endlich reden, dass die Menschenrechte überall auf der Welt gleich sind. Und wir müssen dann aufpassen, dass diese Rechte nicht mit Füßen getreten werden. Alles andere ist es nur also gedacht, damit irgendwelche Menschen, die sich als Islamisten oder Christen oder sonst was dann nennen, dann nur an die Macht kommen und Menschen dann weiter manipulieren. Vielen Dank. Also meine Frage, was Sie unter Islam äh, verstehen. Welchen Islam meinen Sie? Thank you. Uh Let's answer these questions now, maybe, and, and then take some more, because it's, it's getting too much. <laughs> Who would like to start? Let me, let me, since I developed a couple of ideas, let me go okay. first. And, but there are a couple of things. Let me respond very quickly, because we really need to take uh, more questions uh, in this regard. Uh, concerning the inheritance, and that's the importance of meeting and discussing and talking about different perspectives. In Islam, there is no in inheritance of a man over a woman. No, it does not. L let, me just, let me just finish. In Islam, inheritance sometimes for a man can take more than a woman. Sometimes a woman can take more than a man. Sometimes they can take equal. And it all has to do with the social structure of Islam. We can go into detail. I am very sure of what I am saying. Number, 
I, I would no, not history. That is practicing until today. You come and visit me, you will find this in my family in, today in Egypt. So that's reality. For example, the, the mother inherits more than the, the brother. That's what he means. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it is not a gender uh, matter. Number two, concerning. A l- <laughs> then we agree. Uh, <laughs> just, just. But so it is not a gender. It is not a gender discrimination. It is just part of the social structure. Concerning Al Azhar, and Al Azhar can make mistakes. We don't consider anyone to be holy or to be sacred. There is no clergy in Islam. If Al Azhar made a mistake, it is Al Azhar's mistake. It does not necessarily mean that we have to carry the burden of Al Azhar. Concerning one law for everyone, I 100% agree. And it looks a human rights issue, it is great. But there is something we have to keep in mind. With our brothers and sisters, Christian brothers and sisters in Egypt, they have different set of personal laws. For example, divorce is not accepted in the Christian church. If we Muslims come and impose it, it becomes wrong. And we cannot accept imposing a, a, a law on the Christian church. We would like the Christians to live in peace and to live. But other than the personal status, yeah, uh, other than the personal status law, all citizens are equal. And this is the kushari attitude that uh, I, uh, I mentioned uh, before. Concerning Turkey's model, the question about Christians uh, and Muslims. Uh, I personally believe that Christians, Muslims, Jews, liberal seeklers have an area of agreement. If we can work together on what we agree upon, it is going to be very good for everyone. And there is, let us keep the discussion going on. Let us learn from one another. And we, as human beings, I believe in the ability to change. We change. What I was a few years ago is not the same I am now. Uh, Concerning the uh, uh, Egypt experience with Islam is very different from Spain's experience, uh, with uh, Egypt's experience with Copts. You know, when Muslims came to Egypt, Copts were oppressed by the Romans. The Romans persecuted the Copts. So when Muslims came, Muslims were aided by the Coptic Christians so that they can liberate them from the Roman occupiers. That is very different from the experience uh, uh, in Spain. Concerning Turkey's model, I I think I expect Egypt to provide a better alternative than Turkey's model. And there will be different models. Let us look how these different models can come, and then we can judge uh, them uh, later. Concerning this question here about uh, Ikhwan as a closed movement, uh, let us agree that is, that is very true. Due to the fact that I, as a member of Ikhwan, I was not able to teach my students in the university what they're, what they're supposed to learn about issues of human rights, issues of freedom. In my lecture hall, my lectures were recorded by the police apparatus, and they threatened me a couple of times. So in a situation like this, what happens, you become, when you, we couldn't even meet in our homes to discuss things. If more than, you know there is a law in Egypt, if more than five people walk together, they can be arrested. So imagine I and my family cannot really walk in peaceful way in Egypt during Mubarak. So this closed culture created this closed attitude. The fact that we're having the Freedom and Justice Party, we're working hard to open up. And the Freedom and Justice Party is between the Salafists on one side and between a conservative culture on the other side. And we're really working hard to open up. That's why you will find us welcoming Any initiative, we discuss things, we agree, we learn a lot. These meetings help us to learn more. In fact, the parliament speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Katatni, was here in Berlin just yesterday. And so many of us traveled to so many different... We're 
interested in learning. And please, if you have any idea, anything that you would like us to learn more, please share it with us, and we'll be happy to welcome you anytime you visit Cairo or you visit uh, Luxor. So it is a process that is going on. Uh, what last question, if I may comment on it, or sure. that's it. Yeah, concerning what Islam, which type of Islam? I totally disagree. Taliban Islam is not Islam because it is tribal mentality. Educating women, for example, how on earth anyone can come and claim that women cannot be educated? Where one third of Islam came to us through a woman. We had women teachers throughout the history of Muslim world. It is a tribal mentality, and you know tribes have their own limiting cultures. That has nothing really to do. The Saudi Arabia, how on earth a woman cannot drive a car? It is shameful that they attach this to Islam. What we're presenting is very, diff diff very different. It has a huge area of agreement with the uh, European modern experience, but it has its own differences as well. And maybe in another sitting, we can talk about the similarities uh, and the differences. I, allow me to disagree with you. When we went to the streets of Cairo, we did not win, go only for food. We're more, than, we're more than animals. Only animals care for food. We really cared about dignity. And the slogans of the revolution was, yes, social justice, Yes, dignity, yes, human rights. So we're more than just that. We really cared about, I won't like to live in a free country. I would like to be able to speak my mind. I would like to be able to share my feelings. And that is the new Egypt uh, will be working for. That's it. Let me stop here and give a chance to my colleagues here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would any of you like to comment now? Because we have... Would you like to jump in with your question? And yeah, yeah. yeah. please, uh, can we have a microphone here? And then you can both answer. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ismail Maet. I'm first secretary of the Jordanian Embassy. And uh, my question goes to uh, Mrs. Uh, Toprak. Uh, I lived in Turkey for two years. Uh, during the transition when uh, the AK party C1. But I would like to tell you another story, how I saw it. You talked a lot about the government of AKP that um, is becoming very autocratic, um, it becoming a dictatorship. But uh, I wonder, uh, during your turn in power, uh, women wearing a veil were not allowed to go to university. I am... Is that correct? And why is that? Is not a personal liberty to wear a headscarf? I am not in favor of imposing a headscarf, but I wouldn't ban ladies from getting an education. Another story I will tell you. Once I had a meeting with a Turkish officer from the Karaharp Okulu, from the, uh, and it was during Ramadan. And he told me, uh, Ismail, would you like to have a tea? I was not fasting. I said, okay. Then he brought me tea. I said, you are not drinking? He said, no, I'm fasting. But he said it whispering. He said, why are you whispering? He said, because my bosses should not be aware that I am fasting. And if they are aware that I am fasting, they will kick me out from the army. Second point. He told me, uh, we have a prayer room here. I said, oh, so do you pray? He said, no, it's always locked with a lock. And if you go and pray in that prayer room, You are out. So, I am saying Islamization, Islamic Sharia, we want equality, freedom for all, a civil state. But uh, when you were in, in, in power, it was the other, the other face of the coin. Thank you. Please, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll come back to your question uh, because I was going to mention it but there's no time uh, to cover everything but let me go back to your question or let me first answer this uh, my Jordanian friends uh, question about during your turn in power if you mean my party my party was lastly in power in, in the 19th 
20s and 30s. Seculars, yes. <laughs> so if you meant seculars, but secular parties or semi-secular parties, let's put it that way, were, have been ruling Turkey. These are center-right parties since 1950, and included among them were Islamist parties as well, like the old Refah Party, and prior to that, Selamet Party. So, you know, you can't accuse my party uh, uh, alone, although I would agree, and I wrote about this, and I say it publicly as well, yes, the Republic was very radical about Islam. I mean, the experience is very much like the French experience of laicism, and in fact we call it laicism rather than secularism, and it did marginalize Islamist groups. I mean, to think of the Third Republic in France, if you uh, went to ch uh, church to mass regularly every Sunday, you could not get promotions in the French army, and you could not, uh, you would not be given any position in the various uh, French cabinets for 70 years. The Third Republic lasted for 70 years. The Turkish experience has been like that. It was very radical secularism. Whether this was necessary for an Islamic country in the 1920s or not, th that's a whole different. Uh, um, uh, discussion, I won't go into it. So I was indeed going to say that I agree with Mr. Masmoudi that you can't exclude the Islamists. The Islamists in Turkey were totally marginalized, taken out of uh, political power centers, economic power centers, uh, social prestige circles, uh, and intellectual prestige circles. And they've come back with a vengeance, yes. Uh, and indeed, that's what the prime minister says. He said that they are going to raise religious generations who will also be vengeful. That's an awful thing for a prime minister to say because as critical as I was previously of secular governments marginalizing the Islamists, I'm not critical of the Islamists because of the authoritarian measures they're putting into practice. So I won't excuse them. I won't excuse them for the reason that you suggested that because they suffered in the past. I mean, did that, well, didn't you do it? Uh, sort of comes to, comes to it. Uh, yes, it was unfair for, for covered students not to attend the universities. And by the way, it was my party that solved that problem because the leader came out and said they're not going to interfere with anybody's clothing, at which point you know, the problem the next day was solved by the president of this higher board of education who said that students could attend with headscarves. So anyway, that's that. But to come back to uh, your, this young man's uh, 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 question about there's no one image of mankind, this universalism has been problematic. In some ways, yes, but cultural relativism has been very, very problematic as well. And I think that's precisely the problem of the EU countries in their relationship with Islamic or Muslim majority uh, states. Uh, my friend Soli said yesterday that there's no reason to think that Muslims have a different gender, uh, gene than the rest of the uh, you know, uh, Western world, and they don't. They want the same things. When people were protesting on Tahrir Square, the young people, they wanted to be able to speak up their minds, freedom of speech, without facing criminal procedures. Uh, they wanted to be able to to be able to talk about their visions of good society, their political views, their ideologies, and what they want for the future without facing uh, prison sentences. They wanted free press and media to be able to write this, to be able to talk about this in the media. They wanted to form associations with other people, a vibrant civil society, impartial law that's blind to everybody, blind to your religion, blind to your gender, blind to your sexual preference, and what is most important in the Muslim context, blind to your values. 
that whether it's going to be you, he's going, who's going to choose your own value system as to whether you will drink, as to whether you will cover or not, if, if a woman, how you will dress, who you will marry, uh, and so on, whether you will eat pork or not, whether you will go to the mosque, whether you will pray, uh, and, and, you know, you can, you can, uh, uh, increase the examples, uh, what your sexual life is like, and, and so on. Whether it's going to be the individual who's going to decide on this, and the individual is free, of course, to decide by religious principles to which he or she might abide, but the individual should also be free to decide on the basis of some secular ethic, provided that they don't, you know, break the law. Uh, so I think this is the problem in Muslim-majority countries, that the state, especially when Islamic governments, I have yet to see a different example. When Islamic governments come to power, Turkey is a different example. They haven't meddled too much in uh, personal life choices except to ban alcohol in Anatolian cities and to try to ban uh, abortion and, and so on. Uh, but when Islamic governments come to power, Islamist governments come to power, the, 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 uh, you know, all of these areas of personal freedom and choice are restricted. This was the case in the past and history. This has been the case in country after country in the Muslim world. I was in Indonesia when Aceh province was given semi-authority, uh, autonomy. You know what they did? They, put a, they, they stoned a man to death. The very first thing, that was their very first thing to do. So what I'm saying is that, in, as far as I, my last sentence, EU's position should be, I think EU definitely has to leave this relativist position. Uh, that, well, you know, it's Muslims, this is what they want. There are different kinds of democracy, there are different kinds of human rights, there are different kinds of uh, civil rights and so on, and argue for the establishment of these basic rights and liberties in the Muslim world uh, because that's what democracy is all about. Democracy is not simply choosing who's going to be your government. That's a that's procedural democracy, and many countries have gone over that. But that was democracy in the 19th century and early 20th centuries. Since then, it has evolved, and it has come down to many of these issues that, are, that I've talked about. And as far as those are concerned, I don't think there's any room for relativism and you know, what's uh, 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 Western versus other models. Thank you. Um, I have so many questions myself. Uh, I'm, I'm restraining myself here, but I would like I would like to put this uh, um, plea to you and and uh, would like you to comment if there is a consensus on this, or if what you called suitable uh, differs from the vision that was just yeah. laid out. I think. We, we will have to close the session pretty soon because you have to leave at some point here, right? Yeah, in 10 minutes. In 10 minutes. So maybe we have time for one more question and then you can both answer. Uh, gentlemen here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I just have uh, two comments. Sometimes we are talking about the same thing but the concept, the, the, the term we use is different. For example, when we say Sharia, for, for the, the Egyptian colleague, when he say its liberty is uh, uh, respecting other and uh, giving the other the choice to live <laughs> their own way of life, I think it's, it have another counterpart in uh, the secular way of uh, thinking. I think this... Uh, kind of uh, uh, term using or misusing or not understanding the content of the concept is one thing that we should uh, work more deeply about uh, working about the content more than the, uh, the concept in itself. Uh, this is my first comment. The second is uh, I think there is three types of uh, 
Islamists in power. Three, uh, three types, and this gives people a kind of uh, uh, not clear image uh, on how Islamists are in power can behave. The first is the coup d'etat, like in Sudan, and I think when every time when a single party take uh, the, the uh, power by a coup d'etat, it's an authoritarian regime. It's always like that. The second type is the revolution by one single party. So that's really dangerous when one single party lead the revolution and then he will do the same thing because he is the only one in power. The third type is a revolution by all the parties and then there is a democratic elected government then and a sharing power. This is very important. I think the Tunisian and what Egyptian... Power? Sharing of Sharing power. I think this kind of, for example, in the Tunisian exa example, accepting sharing power among uh, uh, moderate Islamists and moderate seculars, it's a very important example to see how both sides developed their ideas among several uh, 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 issues which, uh, which was really uh, tough and serious before, but I think that kind of Bringing together uh, moderate elements from both sides can uh, build a new uh, example in the is uh, Islamic uh, uh, countries. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, who wants to go first? I think you're first, uh, because you've been waited long, reading long. I think we have really excellent questions, and these, these are the debates that we are having in Tunisia and in Egypt, in all the, uh, the Arab countries now. Um, so let me try to address them as quickly as I can. The first one is about ishtihad. Uh, what do we mean by ishtihad? I think it's very, very important concept that uh, we're going to be hearing a lot more about it in the future. First of all, it's not a new concept. It's a very, very old concept. It's as old as Islam is. And if you know the history of Islam, ishtihad was done from the beginning. It's it's a way to reinterpret the text based on the needs and the conditions of the country or the society. And it was very normal for the ulamas, for the religious leaders, to give different opinions when they move from one city to another. Or like after a year or two, they would come up with new interpretations and new, you know, different school of thought. Um, so this is how the first 900 years of Islam, we developed what I think one was of the best civilizations in, in mankind, in man history, in human history. It was very tolerant, it was very uh, progressive, it was very um, egalitarian, uh, modernist, because we had ishtihad, because the interpretation of Islam was very flexible. Depending on the society and the, and the needs of the society, they were always taken into consideration, so it wasn't rigid. And then, unfortunately, about 400 years ago, and some historians say that it started with the loss of Spain, of Andalusia, basically the door of Ishtihad was closed. So for the last 400 or 500 years, we had no Ishtihad, meaning that now we are waking up to, a new, to Islam that is really rigid. Why is it rigid? Because they tell you, well, you have to follow the opinions of the scholars, but the opinions of the scholars have been rigid, fixed in time for the last 500 years. And you know how much the world has changed in the last 400 or 500 years. So we haven't had the chance in Islamic society, in Islamic jurisprudence, to come up with new interpretations of Islam for the 20th century, let alone the 21st century. And things have changed, are changing constantly and almost daily. So I think really ishtihad is going to be the key to the Muslim world modernizing and catching up with modernity without losing its Islamic soul. Because people will not be able, people will not accept to lose their Islamic soul. They want to maintain their religion. If they have to choose between Islam and modernity, they will choose Islam. If they have to choose between Islam and democracy, they will choose Islam. So the problem is we have to come up with a new modern interpretation of how you, what, what does Islam mean in the 21st century? So I think ishtihad is really the answer and is going to be very, very important. But again, it will take time. It will take 20 years, maybe 40 years, to come up with a new modern interpretation of Islam. And again, it will be different 
because it takes the local condition in, uh, in, 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 uh, in consideration. So the ishtihad that we will have in Tunisia will be different from the ishtihad in Turkey or from the ishtihad in Egypt and definitely different from the ishtihad in Saudi Arabia. You know, <laughs> each country is different. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say about Ishtihad. I think it's going to be extremely important. And thank God that we have now some freedom and some democracy in, in these countries that we can really start thinking about Ishtihad. Now, the question of the two models, the, the Turkish model and the Iranian model. I think one of the reasons why we haven't had really democratic transitions in the Arab world or the Muslim world for the last 30 years is that we had only one model, which is the Iranian model, which is a bad model. It's a failed model. When the Iranian revolution start, uh, happened in 1979, a lot of Muslims all over the world were excited. Hey, finally, we have an Islamic government, and they said we're going to be democratic, and we're going to be uh, progressive, and, you know, we're going to... And, of course, it failed. There is no question now in the, in the Muslim world, uh, even among Islamists, that it is a failed experiment, that this is not, a, a, this is not what we have in mind or what we had in mind uh, when, when the revolution happened. And this is why I'm very happy that we have now the Turkish model, even though it's not perfect. <laughs> and even though you are critical of it, for us, it's still, it is still the best model out there. It is still a very, very good model, not perfect, but good model. Good enough that it will help Muslims in Tunisia, in Egypt, in other countries to, to, to see that there is a way to be Muslim and democratic at the same time, and even Muslim and secular at the same time, that there is a way to marry Islam and modernity. And this is very important. So I think the Turkish model, with its imperfections, because even in America, by the way, we're not perfect. And some of the problems that you mentioned in Turkey are happening in America some of the questioning and the, some of the, the way they are treating people and the secret evidence and, and you know all of that is happening even in America, which is 200-year-old democracy. So what I'm saying is that I think the Turkish model can be very helpful. Ours is almost 100-year-old. <laughs> I need people, to go. <laughs> people are getting nervous here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Thank I'm sorry you. that I don't have uh, more time to... Thank you. Have a safe trip. Thank you very much. Bye bye. No, we're not leaving. He's leaving. Yeah. Um, we 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 are also we are also leaving. <laughs> we are also leaving we're pretty also soon. Leaving. We could go on and on, <laughs> of course. But would you like to have a last comment? Any anything? No. I don't know. I guess I, not. I think, I think we, 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 we're going to finish here because we're already very quickly. Let me just very, very briefly and very quickly speak of three uh, points. Number one, it's very important to think of the beginning of the Egyptian revolution. The Egyptian, Egyptians, you remember, 20 million Egyptians were in the streets the day Mubarak came down. And they were all saying, Karama, Hurriya, Adala Iktimaiya, dignity, freedom, and social justice. Egyptians, by the Egyptian revolution, have declared the end of the inferiority complex. We hope to our European friends is not to deal with us as they used to deal with us during the colonial era. We need to be equal partners. We have a lot in common. We can work together for a better world for all of us. And in this, I have three R's. The first one is the revolution. We made it. There was no aid from anywhere. Number two is the reform. And we need European friend in this. With security, with judiciary, with many other things. And the third one is the renaissance. And we will do the best we can to produce another renaissance, a different renaissance that agrees with the European renaissance 60-70%, but it has its own uh, Egyptian taste. I think I'm highly optimistic about the future. We have a lot of things to do together, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And thank you all for coming. <laughs>